So, bom dia. <laughs> I've used my three words of Portuguese, so I have to switch to English. I hope you don't mind. Um, we're going to talk about planning for Hoshin Kanri and, and how this relates uh, to its development at uh, Toyota. And um, I, I want to begin with, first of all, this is going to be in two parts. The first part is really getting to understand what Toyota is and what it isn't. A lot of what you've read about Toyota is, I'm going to call the myth of Toyota. It's not the reality of Toyota. And so what I want to talk about is discovering then the Toyota Motor Corporation. There are lots of books written about Toyota, but we start seeing Taichi Ono, Shigeo Shingo, Monden, uh, Jeffrey Liker, and so forth have written quite a few things about Toyota. We've also seen books written about Lean by James Womack and, and Daniel uh, Jones and so forth. But those books are focusing on production systems, philosophical methods, tools, and techniques that have made Toyota excellent. What I want to do is focus us on the management system that actually integrates all of those things. So where did lean methods come from? Lean methods were actually called just in time at Toyota when I first became acquainted with them in 1983. In 1983, I was an engineer at Hewlett Packard and I was told that for one of my jobs, I had to design a plastics factory, and that the plastics factory had to use something called SMED. Now, at that point in time, doing a mold change on an injection machine took four hours. We got it down to seven minutes. And the interesting thing was, on one machine, we did 22 mold changes a day, and those were making the parts that were gonna use the next day to produce paint jet. And then we moved PaintJet to a little country nearby, you may have heard Spain, in Barcelona. And so we created the HP factory in Barcelona to make paint jets for the European market because it was so overwhelmingly a success. But we started thinking about lean methods. In Japan, they actually started in 1896, the very first Jadoka machine or man inter interface with the machine was in Toyota Textiles. And it was by the founder of the Toyota company, Sakichi Toyota, and it was actually on a textile machine. It was a little mechanical device that was reading the tension on a thread. And as you're making a piece of cloth, you're making it two pieces, the wharf and the woof. And when they come together, you're actually trying to tighten them up and to make them look uh, so, so it's one piece of, of fabric. But if one of those threads breaks, then you get a little flaw. And what this machine did was it stopped the machine the moment you got the tension. So a human could then intervene and fix the flaw so that the actual cloth at the end was fault free. That was 1896. And so we start looking then at what happened after that. We see uh, Kichiro Toyota, Eiji Toyota, uh, Sorichiro Toyota, and the Toyota family, which has managed and owned the company since it was founded in 1896, that they have had this tradition of dealing with lean thinking, which we call lean thinking in the West only. They don't call it lean in Japan. They call it the Toyota way. And so we start seeing that lean methods were developed in the West well after we had implemented them at Hewlett Packard. In 1985, we start seeing this MIT study that was being conducted about automotive industry and the book, The Machine That Changed the World. The machine was not the car, it was the Toyota production system. And as we start taking a look at this, what we start seeing is that this term was actually created by a guy named John Krafchick, who was in his MIT program at Sloan for a master's degree. And he wrote a master's thesis. By the way, any of these research articles, I'm gonna give uh, to Henrika so she can put them up on the web, because uh, I have all of them in references, so you don't have to go looking in the web for them, you'll get them. So John Krafchick wrote this, and that lean term then was used by Womack and Jones when they created the book to document the five-year study. Now, interestingly enough, that book was not actually the first book that was describing the Japanese manufacturing techniques. That was actually written by Richard Schoenberger uh, previously about 1987. So when the machine that changed the world, changed the world came out, Schoenberger had written his second book called World Class Manufacturing. And in the appendix, he had an honor roll of companies in America that had done something with lean. And if you look at that, you see out of the 100 different footnotes, 80 of them referred to Hewlett Packard. 
And what happened at HP when I was there, we had people coming from overseas to help us understand Japanese production. The reason for that was in 1981, we had received the Deming Prize at Yokogawa Hewlett Packard. And when you receive the Deming Prize, the Japanese companies go, open kimono and show you all they've got. Okay, so what happened is we were able to go to different companies. So between 1983 and 1984, I had joined that team to go make those visits, 27 one-week visits in Japanese companies, seeing how they manufacture things, how they discovered and how they did things. At first, we were just typical engineers. We went and looked for tools, and we found lots of tools, and we came back and created toolkits, and we created training courses. And I remember we had gone to about 11 of those weeks, and our CEO, John Young, came into a meeting, and he said, you know, I hope you guys are enjoying your vacations in Japan. That was a hint. We probably were not pleasing him somehow. And so one of us was bold enough to say, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, you brought all these training and all these tools back, that's wonderful, but it hasn't changed the business. The reason I sent you there was that when Yokogawa Hewlett Packard started their journey of five years in 1976, they were the least profitable company we had in all of HP. We bought them, Yokogawa Electric Works, and they're a subsidiary now. And they were the 56th in profit, 56th in every performance measure. And in 1981, when they won the Deming Prize, they were number one. What I want you to tell me is, how did they do that? Now, we were rotating, because HP believes in collaboration, the leadership of this team, and it was my turn to go there. And so I said, well, let's go. We were going to see Fujitsu. I said, let's do it the Japanese way. We're not going to take the air-conditioned bus. We're going to take the, the train, the local train. And in Japan, they have pushers to shove you into the train, right? And when you get there, you're, you've been sitting in the train like this for, oops, 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 for like this for a half an hour or so forth. And the next thing you know, you get out, you're saying, oh, I can't move. And then the meaning of the Japanese calisthenics at the beginning of the day made sense. It was about ergonomics. It's about how do you get somebody who's been sitting there like this to start moving things? You gotta get them loosened up so their shoulders can move and so that they can actually do something human once again instead of being a sardine in a train car. And then we started, so something's different. So I said to the team, we're going into the lobby and let's treat this like it's a supplier quality audit. And so the very first thing I did when we went to a supplier quality audit, we'd go into the lobby and we'd look at what was there. And it was very nondescript, it was very cheap. There's a plastic leather, faux leather couch. There's some couple of plants. There's the mandatory certificates with all the, the Japanese certifications on the wall. There's a little religious doohickey above that. And then there's a desk and a receptionist. And we went and sat on the couch and the couch is facing the papers. And so you read them and you say, okay, well, here's the, the factory standard systems and here's a piece of measurement about the factory and how well they're doing. And what's that little doohickey above? Well, I've lived in Japan for two years. So I said, that's a Shinto shrine. And the light bulb came on. What is a Shinto shrine? Now, they call it a religion, but Shinto shrine, every Japanese who's born is born a Shinto. And what it is, it's about the respect, the reverence that's given to your ancestors. And it's appreciation of the things that they have done for you to get you to this current place in life where you are and the advantages that you have. And it's tradition to have these shrines in every neighborhood. And what happens is you go to your neighborhood shrine and you may remember your great grandfather by leaving a mandarin orange, or if you like uh, sake or whiskey, maybe some Santori whiskey or a little uh, cold sake, something like this, or, or maybe just a few nuts but a little something, and what that says is, I have gotten enough surplus in my life. I have a sufficiency that I still have enough left over to remember you. And then I realized that shrine is sitting above the factory performance measures. The factory performance measures are sitting above all of the certificates. That was not a random selection of some artist saying, how do we decorate the lobby of our food, of our, uh, uh, factory. And so we said, let's go in with our eyes opening. We have been missing the systemic component of this. We've been missing the culture. We've been missing the thing that links it together. 
Now, I was a systems engineer. I got my systems engineering degree in 1975, the first master's program actually in the US in systems engineering. And so uh, I started thinking about, well, what's the system that's pulling this all together? And we went around and we did see some measures and stuff and we saw some indicators and we started asking. So our guide was Katsu Yoshimoto. Katsu was the quality manager from Yokogawa Hewlett Packard and we didn't really speak, let's just say we didn't speak Japanese, Goshi maybe, just a little bit, but we could understand some of the terms. And so he was translating for us. And we asked him, what is it that's actually pulling this all together? He says, oh, that's Hoshin. And we said, oh shit? <laughs> no, Hoshin. And so as we looked at it, he said, well, what's that? He says, it's a planning system. And I remember one of the guys said a joke that became uh, like a fire in HP running, oh shit, another planning system. <laughs> and so we said, well, what is this thing, Hoshin? So he introduced us to Dr. Makabe and to Dr. Akaho, who created QFD, and they explained Hoshin to us. And so we brought this idea back that there is two responsibilities in a company. And so as we take a look at that, what we started seeing was the responsibility in the workplace is one, but there's another responsibility in the executive system. And that's what Hoshin is all about. It's about fulfilling an executive's responsibility for quality. And I do a lot of executive coaching, and one of the things that I ask when they say, oh, I don't do quality, I've delegated that to the quality managers. Have you heard that? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I usually say, oh, so you don't care about how much money you make? Oh, no, 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 I care. And so you really don't care, you know, if you're manipulating EBITDA to look good for the shareholders? EBITDA is a horrible measure, by the way. You're going to pay taxes, you're going to pay interest, and you better put some money aside for depreciation because your factory's getting old. Okay, so those are three mistakes that you make as a CEO. But why do you use EBITDA? Because it makes you look more profitable. You know where that measure came from? Hedge fund operators, the people who actually crashed the world economy back in 2008, right? So you really want to follow them? The world's, well, he may not be this week. Jeff Bezos is the world's richest man this week, but Warren Buffett, he says, you never use a bit to evaluate a company because it's artificial. And so as you start looking at it, these things that we start seeing about lean are actually not the truth of what's happening in the system. So what I'd like to do is to talk to you, first of all, through the lens of my good friend, Noriaki Kano. So Noriaki Kano came to Hewlett Packard in 1983. And when he came to HP, I was a big strapping guy who'd been a football player, was doing powerlifting. I carried his briefcase. Because back then, we didn't have PowerPoint slides. We had these things called acetates. They were slides, but they were physical slides you had to put down. And he had a thousand of them in his bag. And it was like 40 kilos. And he's a little guy, and they figured he shouldn't carry that, so I'm a big guy, so I should carry his bag. Well, now when I go to Japan, he carries my bag. It's not 40 kilos, because I couldn't carry that either. And so Kano has gotten to be a very good friend since then. And one of the jokes he likes to tell is that we should beware of fourth generation sushi. And he says, many times the quality movement has become fourth generation sushi. So in first generation sushi, the fish is prepared by a Japanese chef in Roppongi in Tokyo. The second generation sushi, it's prepared by a Japanese chef who came to America. His name was Nobo. So Nobo's got a series of sushi restaurants in America that are excellent. The third generation sushi, Nobo chained an American chef to make the sushi in America because he couldn't make it at all of his restaurants. And the fourth generation sushi is when the American went to Japan and made sushi with beef. And they took me to that restaurant where they now make beef sushi. And so it's kind of missed the point, hasn't it? It was supposed to be about fish and the way you prepare it in Japan. But this is what's happened. So someone showed this book from Hoshin that was written in 2006. That's not what the Japanese do. That is not Hoshin Kanri. That is what they call Hoshin Tenkai. Hoshin Tenkai, it means rollout. It's the distribution of a set of objectives. And what most of the West misses is that Hoshin itself is called in Japan strategic management by planning. It's something totally different. 
And because we take this X matrix, which is not created by this guy, I can't even remember his name, it was created by a guy named Rikuku in 1997. Okay, and it's published in Japan as an X matrix, and that was the first time it was introduced. It's not generally used by most of the companies. So I'll show you what the Hoshin is all about. We'll talk about the culture uh, of where this came from. And this is kind of my introduction to all of this. This is Sorichito Toyota. Oops, not that one. I have, nope. So there's a pointer here someplace. Ah, there he is. This is Sorichito Toyota. That's Dr. Kano, Moriaki Kano. This is Hitoshi Kume, who's in charge of the Japanese Standards Association. Yoshinoro Itsuka, who at that time had the chair of Ishikawa at the University of Tokyo. And this is Yannick Mehta, who was the president of the International Academy for Quality following me, and that's me. And, and Dr. Sorichito Toyota is the first counselor to the International Academy for Quality. And so when we talked about this and we had a couple of days together, uh, I want to share with you some of the learnings that I got from Dr. Toyota and what's happened since that time. So we have to go back in the history. Toyota Man uh, Motor Company was founded in 1935. Uh, and before then, before he died, what we saw was Sakichi Toyota, who created that first just-in-time machine, had his five principles. And then his son, Kichiro Toyota, formalized them in the very first statement of the Japanese culture of Toyota. Now read the first principle. It says, be contributive to the development and welfare of the country by working together, regardless of position, in faithfully fulfilling your duties. Uh, excuse me? Isn't that what we are talking about in terms of Shinto faith? And duty, the Japanese word is giri. Giri means the same as bushido, the way of the warrior. It's the sense of duty you have that goes well beyond yourself. And so as we start taking a look at this, be at the vanguard of the times, be innovative. You know, uh, through uh, endless creativity, inquisitiveness, and the pursuit of improvement. Hmm. Improvement came out in 1937, 35. And as we start looking back then, actually improvement came out in 1916 by a man from uh, France named Henri Fayot in general and industrial management. And he said the executive in charge should have an endless pursuit of improvement in every area. The executive in charge, he focuses it as an executive duty. Hmm. So, and we start seeing, be kind, generous, strive to create a warm, home-like environment, and be reverent. Show gratitude for great things and small. So even the little things we should say thank you for, in both thought, the thinking environment, and action, the working environment. Well, that's actually a cultural statement, isn't it? And it's a cultural statement for the whole organization. In 2006, the latest son of this, this family had a revised version that came out and it just basically modernized it. It didn't change the depth of that culture. And so when we start seeing what people are talking about Toyota's culture, they use a 2006 version. But I think what's interesting is you go back in the history and from 1937 to 2006, 69 years, the culture didn't change. And all of the management systems that were created were created within the arms of that culture. And so it's very important to realize that culture has been a driver in Toyota. This is the vision where they're talking about the future. I can't read it, you can't read it, so I'm gonna skip it. You can get the PowerPoint slides and see it. But how does Toyota define success in business? So first of all, it's success for humanity. It's for the teams. It's for the individuals. It's for the company. It's not predominantly financial. Financial success enables overall success. It gives us the resources to apply in the organization to keep the organization permanently improving. So, You've heard about Hoshin projects, perhaps. Have you ever heard about a project called ERI? An ERI project is an interesting project. So you probably have heard of the Prius car, right? 
Okay. Prius took a while to develop. Does anybody know what the R&D budget for Prius was? Anybody want to guess? Come on, your students, guess. You guess on your exams all the time, right? <laughs> what was the budget for Prius? Throw out a number. 100 million, more or less. Guess what? Toyota doesn't know. They didn't have a budget. <laughs> what? No. An Erie project is so important, you don't budget for it. You don't constrain it by the minds of the people who think about money. You constrain it by the resources required to make it a success. When I talked with the chief engineering for Prius, he told me something that I found surprising. He said, you won't believe how long it took us to develop the batteries. Anybody want to guess? 20 years? 20 years? 30. Oh, I told you. That's why you know. <laughs> Never trust Pedro. <laughs> Particularly if you're going to be going up against him when you're defensive your thesis. Okay. <laughs> I know this guy. Okay, so, so what we start seeing is Toyota's trying to manage its business as a system. Now, we've considered the Toyota management system to be a synonym, in many cases, for the Toyota production system. But that assumption, it's wrong. So when I got a chance to talk to Dr. Sorichito Toyota, I knew that in 1963, he was the chief quality officer for Toyota as a company. And he formulated a first cross-functional quality steering committee. And on that steering committee was Taiichi Ono. And so I was curious. I said, Dr. Toyota, could you relive for me that first meeting of the steering committee and tell me what it was like? And he said, that Taiichi Ono. He was very difficult. He said, we must have the Toyota production system deployed in all areas of our business. And I replied, dummy dummy! Now, there's three types of no's in a Japan. The first no is, do you want some more vegetables or would you like dessert? I call this the soft no. A, no thank you. The second kind of no is the kind you have in muda. It's the word mu, it means sort of the religious, thou shalt not. And the third kind is, dummy dummy no dummy! And that's when your little child is about to put their hand into a hot stove. <laughs> and you want to get this startle reaction. I'm doing something wrong. And that's what he said to Taiichi Ono. He says, yes, we must have the Toyota production system in production. But throughout all businesses, we must develop a Toyota management system. That was 1963. In that year, and the contribution, the next year they won the Deming Prize as a company, the contribution that's cited when a company wins a Deming Prize, they have to advance the knowledge of quality. And the contribution Toyota made was the cross-functional team. But they were working with two other companies, Bridgestone, which made the tires that go on the Toyota cars, and they had what they called the flag system. And the flag system was a system of management that had predictive analytics. So at the base was three measures, quality, cost, and time. And they had to be able to be assimilated into the measures that drive the corporation. I hate the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard is archaic. The balance scorecard is the figment of the imagination of two Harvard guys who couldn't understand what it really was about. Okay, now I've heard a lot of people talk about the balance scorecard today. But you know where they got it from? First article, balance scorecard, read the footnote, Harvard Business Review. We learned about this from a major company. Well, that's really helpful. But if you go back, and some of you professors can do that, look at the Harvard case studies written by Norton about analog devices. An analog devices scorecard, which was written by a guy named Art Schneiderman. Arch Schneiderman was the chief quality officer. He wrote a paper in 1988 that was published in Quality Progress about the scorecard and strategic planning at analog devices. And you know who he learned from? Katsu Yoshimoto of Yokogawa Hewlett Packard, 
who talked about the business fundamentals and how it all lined up into a predictive system to create the scorecard. And then they used that to create the scorecard at analog devices. Schneiderman gave him a briefing and Nolan was there and he went up and asked him about it. And he then perverted the whole thing into, it's balanced, choose your measures. Yeah, you really got a predictive system there. Who cares about balance? Not one CEO I know because most of them are hindsight reporting measures. I have to deliver the next quarter, not explain the last quarter. I have a communications department who's here to explain the last quarter. My job is to figure out what do we do next. It's not even the executive's job. Hmm. Well, this is talking about intellectual honesty here, isn't it? So what I want to do is to say, okay, what's the system then that drives Toyota? How do they put this all together? So we have to go back a little bit in time. And Walter Schuhart created what is called the Schuhart cycle, which became in Japan uh, in 19, well, let's go back a little bit. 1911, Frederick Taylor wrote Principles of Scientific Management. And in that book, he advanced management because before then, in 1777, Adam Smith had said, we have a division of labor. We have planners and we have doers, okay? That was a division of labor. And then along came Shuhart, I mean, uh, Taylor, who said, ah, we also have inspectors. And what do inspectors do? They see. So that was translated into Japanese in 1912. And it was translated by a guy named Konosuke Matsushita. Y'all have heard of his company, right? Matsushita Heavy Industries. It's probably better known by its commercial brand, Panasonic, okay? He's known as the grandfather of management in Japan. And if you want to read a book, he's got a little book, As I See It, that talks about his philosophy. But he created and funded the Japanese Efficiency Society in, 20, in 1912. And the Japanese Efficiency Society was trying to understand how do we translate this book of Taylor's into something that's useful. And so they did. And you know what the title is called? The Secret of Hidden Waste. They were looking at waste back in 1912, and the Efficiency Society was there. So it wasn't just about Toyota generating something in the 1960s or 1970s or the magic of Shigeo Shingo. It was built into the whole system and culture based on their way of thinking because they don't have any resources in the island. All of their resources come in. They cannot afford to waste anything. And so they, they have worked continuously over many, many years to get rid of waste. And so in Japan, the Efficiency Society took Taylor's idea and they melded it with Schuhart's idea about specification, production, and inspection, which was based on Schuhart's concept of statistics, that we have a hypothesis, we experiment, and then we have the test of the hypothesis, which is the foundation of the scientific method. And they called that Plan Do See. Now, along comes Dr. Deming in the 1950s. And he had a six-step model which did not say Plan, Do, Check, Act. It did not say Plan, Do, Study, Act. Deming never said Plan, Do, Check, Act. Deming said in his last days before he died, actually literally, he died in 1993 and 1992, he said, we should call it Plan, Do, Study, Act. And the Japanese didn't change anything. Because study, and you all can, you getting ready for exams tomorrow? All right. <laughs> so, you know what study is about, right? Wait till the last minute and read as much as you can, hope some of it sticks in your head, right? That's what study is all about. But plan, do, check means I have to have a standard. So if I'm going to put this cap on, how do I know that the thread on here will match the thread on there? I have a standard. And they were engineered so that the standard would go together, just like the cork would go into the bottle and thread properly. Okay, so we have standards as the basis for everything. And so as we start taking a look, Plan, Do, Check Act was actually created by a man named Shigeru Mizuno in 1959. And his claim to fame is he was the first note taker for Deming's lectures. And he couldn't understand what Deming was saying. He said, how do I justify this with Plan, Do, C? And so C, with your eyes, became check. Check the work against the standard. 
check the work against the vision of where you want to go or the direction or your goal. But to check is an active step. Study is not active, it's passive. If I really want to go and study something, I will have some experience in that field. That's why you do internships. That's why you go out to companies, to get that first experience. So what we see today is that there's really two systems happening. In the Japanese standard for quality, and yes, there is one written in English, and you can download it from the Japanese Society for Quality Control website. There's a standard for daily management, for total quality management, and for Hoshin Conry. Okay, and you won't see the things that you see in the American standards because they don't read the Japanese standards. Okay, but the very first thing you'll see is that when they have this selection there, and I think, yep, there, it begins with SDCA, and at the check step, when things are out of control, it leads into Plan Do Check Act. This is the daily management system, and this is the change management system. And the check is a strategic action by the executive team to say, are we needing to have additional resources because this team can't do improvement on the SDCA any longer? And we as a management team have to figure out how do we apply resources differently? So Toyota is managed as a system. And the idea is that in Gemba 1, we have this daily management system. And what we're doing is we're organizing the flow of work. We're making sure the flow of work is continual, not continuous. One of my pet peeves is all of the mistranslations from the Japanese, okay? So plan, do, check, act is continual improvement. It is not continuous improvement. Oh, how did that happen? Well, you know, the Japanese don't speak English so good. So when Dr. Kano gives a speech or writes a paper, he sends it to me and he says, Greg, will you brush up my English? Which usually means rewrite it and then send it back and then he'll change it a little bit and then he'll publish it. So, there was a choice in words back in the beginning when the Japanese things were first being translated into English. And one of the guys who did that was David Liu. And David Liu did us a couple of mis... Well, I'm going to call it misfortunes, okay. So, I was going to call it something stronger. But the first thing was, we have the fishbone diagram. He called it cause and effect. It's actually called the quality characteristics diagram in Japanese. It had nothing to do with causation. It had to do with how do you do value engineering and how do you do a rational breakdown of whatever's in the head, typically a product. And then the, West, the way you do a rational breakdown is those six or seven different bones. They're originally four. They went to six, and I've added a seven called money. There's Money makes the world go round, just ask my wife. Okay, so as you look at that, all of those bones out there are different ways of understanding or breaking down what's in this system, okay? Now, continuous versus continual is another interesting thing. Deming was very hard on this. He said it should be continual improvement. ISO 9000 used to say continual improvement, but the people who put that in there have moved off the committee, so the committee changed and made it just improvement. So what's the difference between continuous and continual? Well, interestingly, the etymology to that difference goes back to the 1600s. The first word created was created in French, and it stands for this continuous. And just 30 years later, continual came out. And the difference is continuous is consistently flowing. It doesn't stop. Continual has a reflection piece in it. Plan, do, check. That's a time for reflection. The Japanese call that hansei. And it means we go back and think about what we did right and wrong and what can we learn. It's a continual learning process. That's why we have exams. Sorry. And that check step is, did you learn? Okay. If you're a continuous student, that means you didn't take any exams. Okay. I never had to check, did I actually get it down? And that was one of my mistakes I made in university some years back. So what we see is Toyota. Well, you've heard about Taiichi Ono. Didn't have much of a career. He was the vice president of manufacturing at Toyota Motor Company from 1947 to 1987. He couldn't get promoted. What a loser. <laughs> yeah. But this is what he said. The key to the Toyota way and what makes Toyota stand out is not any of the individual elements. It ain't the tools. But what is important is having all the elements together as a system. 
Maybe he did learn something from uh, Sorichito Toyota. It must be practiced every day in a very consistent manner, not in spurts. So I've seen some companies say, oh, we're going to do a Kaizen Blitz event now, and we'll come back. You've got to do 24 Kaizen events this year. That's spurts. It's not part of a systemic approach to management. And so what we see is that this is one of the things that I have to take a look at. The only article I ever recommend people read about Toyota is this one by Steven Spear in Harvard Business Review, which is called Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System. And what he says is there's four ingredients, or he called them rules, in the system. And if you take a look at them, I think it's very true. The first one is all work must be highly specified as to content, sequence, timing, and outcome, and that's the daily management system. It's the fundamental, most important thing that operates in Toyota. The second system is every communication, every supplier customer communication must be direct and there must be an unambiguous yes or no way to send requests and receive responses. And that's clear communication channels. That's why there's Kanban in this mechanical system. By the way, more important than Toyota than mechanical Kanban and cars is the electronic Kanban today. Uh, the electronic Kanban is what really runs the company, not the mechanical one. And the pathway for every product and service must be simple and direct, and that's managing flow of activities. And finally, any improvement must be made in accordance with the scientific method, which they call the PDCA method, under the guidance of a teacher, which is the supervisor, at the lowest possible level in the organization, and that's structured problem solving. And those four ingredients are actually put into place at every level throughout Toyota. Now, we ask this question, one of the things we should understand is what is daily management? So daily management is the fundamental process which we administer work and we use to apply it to get things done. And we can start seeing a whole list of different activities here in daily management. And this is where we see the continual, incremental renewal of work. And that means that every time we're doing something, if I get a new person coming into my group, we have to renew the work. And that is actually a continual improvement process. I've got a new component in the system, and that's this new individual who's bringing with them their skills, their competence, their interests, and that's going to fundamentally change the way a team works. And so we have this process of continual improvement happening. And to succeed in daily management requires processes be properly documented, measures be accurately reported, and, and work status, uh, and, and the performance reviews, be conducted so that we get integrity in the system. So integrity means that the system is reporting with honesty. It's reporting with clarity. It's not playing any games. And one of the problems we have in Western companies is we play games with our numbers. I had the CEO of one of the largest telecommunications companies in Europe who just took over his job and he says, you know, I came to look at my performance indicators and all these KPIs and you know what? I'm just guessing. I'm getting averages. I'm getting all of this information so consolidated, I don't know what the actions are. And these are things that are going on back and forth, and they're most of it's reporting. I can't tell what I'm supposed to do to drive this company into the future. And if that's the case of your executive team, how can they actually lead? They're actually going to be followers of what we did in the past. And how long does it take you to close your books and understand what happened last month? If it takes you 10 days, that means the first half of your month, you're not managing that company. You're using what happened the month before as your knowledge base. And so we have to think very differently. And as we get into a world of technology and data systems and digitization, we have the opportunity to think differently. And that will fundamentally change our management system. Now, we talk about productive systems. They have four components. First of all, there's a mechanism of production. That's hardware and software. Then there's the human component, the people who are in the system doing the work or designing the system that they're using. And then there's information component that defines the knowledge. What do we know about what we're going to do? And how do we actually then put this system together so we get the human skills and competence all coming together? And then finally, we get data collected to define the means by which that system operates. And when we look at this, we see there's two sources of system errors. And one source is going to be the system itself. 
And to that source, we've talked about two different types of problem solving. We have analytic problem solving, which in Six Sigma people call Demaic, and we have innovative problem solving, which is what people call Design for Six Sigma. Demaic is actually trying to close a quantitative gap in performance measures in the process it's operating. Design for Six Sigma is trying to remove ambiguities about what we should do in the future. We want to design for performance up here, but we're down here. How do we get there? We don't know. And we have to get rid of the ambiguities that cloud up the reasons that allowed us to define a clear pathway to get to the future. And so as we start taking a look at this, what we start seeing analytic problem solving is what we're used to as a quality community. We're used to doing lots of different tools, but we really haven't put them all together. As a matter of fact, somebody was talking this morning about 8D, somebody else is talking about PDCA, somebody else is talking about DMAIC, and guess what? They don't do the same things. And somebody else was talking about root cause analysis. So what we, we need is a clear language for what do we mean by structured problem solving. And actually, my friend Pedro and Paulo, I don't know if he's here yet or not, he's gonna sneak in this afternoon sometime, you know, uh, and a couple of other professors from Europe have been working with me since 2014 to say, can we actually create a language of structured problem solving that works no matter what discipline you come from? In finance, they call it activity-based costing. In IT, they call it business process management or business process re-engineering. Some people call it systems engineering. Some people call it Lean Six Sigma. Some people call it Kaizen. But if you take a look at it, at the base, the tools are all the same. And oh, by the way, most of them are archaic and need to be fixed anyhow. You know, it's a shame when I'm using FMEA. It was created the year after I was born and I'm gonna be 70 this year. And it hasn't been changed. Didn't we learn something in the last 69 years? Yeah, but we're still using the same old tools in the same old ways. And we have to fundamentally shift our emphasis to get to the modern era where we're gonna be able to go and use these tools. Innovative problem solving is correcting designs in error. And what happens as we go to digitization, we will get rid of the analytic issues in the workplace because the robots won't make mistakes. But humans who design the robots and design the processes will. So what's gonna happen is it's still gonna be the humans. We still have the control of mistakes in the factory. So we can stay proud of that one, okay. The second component though is human components. As we're looking at this, what we start seeing is that this is about removing inadvertent errors, mistake proofing. It's about getting best practices and so forth. And as we're looking at that, we start saying, there's lots of things we need to do to make improvements. So the future you see is the future you'll get. And this is the one we have to say, the seeds of the future are actually planted in our past. They're planted in the present. I've been doing futuring and future studies since 1993. And we can get the future pretty much roughly right, not maybe precisely right. And what that means is we have to learn about some new things called situational awareness and sense making. These come out of the field of social psychology. But situational awareness is I notice something. It registers in my mind. I record it and then I preserve those observations so they can be, have something practiced on it or done with it. Sense making is reading and integrating and deciding and acting based on those observations. And if you want to take a look, that's Carl Wick who wrote Sociology of Psychology 1997 and several other works. That's the foundation of behavioral economics. Now the Toyota system, there was a hint by Taiichi Ono, this is all from his workplace management book. He says, you can view office work the same as production floor where we make things. Or you can, have, you can have the Gemba philosophy for administrative work by identifying your administrative Gemba. And he's giving us a hint. There's two different Gembas. There's an administrative Gemba and an industrial Gemba. And we start seeing managerial departments think they don't need supervision because we can't see the work, it's invisible but it's the invisible factory that controls the Toyota production line. You know, that conveyor belt, it's not going because it's seeing a, a Kanban card. It's going because it's reading the information technology, says here's the incoming rate, and that sets up the talk time, and we move the conveyor belt this speed, and when we move at this speed, we either increase or decrement the size of the production line, and we also change the music, the people here in the Nagoya factory, because we move with music. Well, some of you move better than I do with music. 
And so as you start looking at that, what we start seeing is the white collar workers tend to get uh, re rotated out of their jobs every two or three years. And we, we go in and we create something new. And guess what? We never see the fruition of it because I created this new thing. I got my reward. I go to my next job and the person comes in and says, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to change it. The next thing you know is nobody ever does what we're supposed to do in science and that's build on the knowledge of others. We tear down the knowledge of others in administrative work, and as a result, we never create scientific management. That's a failure. Because if you take a look in Japan, they have conscientiously moved step by step. And so what they do is they create sort of two different types of change systems. There's an operational change, and there's a strategic change. And strategic change is going to change the way the business operates so that management aligns its resources to help the operational change cope with discontinuities, to cope with the disruption in the business that is outside of their control. So those two systems have to operate in harmony. So what we see is strategic change, we often see pointed as these step functions. And if we just do that, then what happens is entropy. Now, entropy is a very natural event. It happens to everything. When I was younger, I was a weightlifter and my muscles were up here. Entropy. You know, my chest was up here. Entropy, right? We won't talk about what happens to ladies, that's not polite. But you know, everything is affected by entropy. And the way around entropy, it's not continual improvement by itself. We have to have some big boosts, but what it is, it's actually living the dream of Musashi. Now Miyamoto Musashi was a Japanese warrior. He actually created sword fighting. And the reason I introduce him here is he's the guy who created the term Hoshin. Well, the first half of it, Ho. He created the word Ho. It means method or form. And it was in his book, The Book of Five Rings. And when he talks about the book, he says, perception is strong and sight is weak. In strategy, it's important to see distant things as if they were close and to take a distance view of close things. So I created what I called the Musashi matrix. So here we have the, the entity and how are we looking at it, a close or a distance? And here we have our perspective, a close view or a distant view. So if I take a close view of a uh, close object, then I have, oh, it's called micromanagement. That's management myopia. I'm going to come and examine exactly what you do. I don't like you doing that. Do it this way. Of course, management never tell you anything like that, right? And then over here, what we see is we have a distance view of a distance thing, and this is called management hyperopia or lack of focus. I don't know where we're going, but we're getting there. Okay. And here we take a profound view of the future, and here we have a profound view of the present. And so as we look at things, we have to be able to understand what's going on. That's the job of management, to understand the things of the present and to be able to project what do we need to do to help my people get to the future. Now, that means we combine the two together. So we have breakthrough when we have resources applied by management and the workers then do incremental improvement to take us to the next step. And what's happening is when we have breakthrough, Oh, we've got engineering students. I can talk a techie thing. How many of you understand process capability? Yeah, oh, there are not as many hands as I was liking to see here. Come on, this is on the exam tomorrow. Okay, so process capability is an index, okay? And it's comparing the ideal, what you'd like to do, the specification of the customer, divided by six standard deviations of the process variation. There's two indices, CP and CPK. CP is ideal. If your CP is uh, one, it means that six standard deviations of your, your process performance will fit into the upper lower spec limits. And that's just kind of a marginal process because processes move around a lot. If your CP is two, that means it'll fit in twice and that's a Six Sigma process. Now, the problem is when you implement something new, you never get the engineering design. Because the engineering design is advertising speak. What does that mean? It means it's done in a noise-free environment. 
So when you put it in the real world, what you find is you got something less. And the thing that you got less is what CPK is. So CPK is the gap between what you wanted to get, that's here, and what you actually got, that's here. And the way we improve from CPK to CP, or what we actually invested in, is through continual improvement. And so as we're starting to look, we can start saying, we can start putting some things together. It's the magic of and. We have to take the systems that we design and add the incremental improvement to it. We can't get there just by buying our way into a new technology. So profound knowledge is knowledge required to maintain success of an organization or to extend it over some period of time. And it has to be generated by leadership as a way to steer the organization. Now steering is important because the second word in Hoshin is sometimes translated the steering function. It comes from the Chinese word qin, which means the, the illuminated dial on a compass. It's the phosphorus that points to north or magnetic north so you can see your way even on the darkest night. Ho, the first word, is coming from method or form, from Musashi. It's the same word for soldier. But what it actually means, it's the second position in kendo, because Musashi was a sword fighter. And he created the art of fighting with two swords. That was not Bruce Lee. Okay. And the second position in kendo, the first position is interesting. It's a bow. So in Japan, there are three bows. The first bow is if I'm coming into the office and I just want to say hello to my assistant, and I just bob my head. I say, ohayo gozaimasu, bop. No, actually, because she's a woman, I would only say, ohayo. And she would say, ohayo gozaimashita. And she has to bow differently. It's never going to work. I have a liberated assistant who won't work that way. OK. But then if you're going into a negotiation and you're talking peer to peer, then you bow with your hands to your side. And you bow down, but you look him in the eyes. I don't quite trust you. But when you are going to fight in kendo, you bow down and face your eyes to the floor. And what that signals is, you are worthy to kill me. Because those fights are fought to the death. Now, when a CEO properly apologizes in Japan for failures of their product for quality, which bow are they supposed to use? You're worthy to kill me. I am really so sorry. Gomen Asai. I'm really sorry. But remember when the CEO of Toyota came out after the Prius and he came into the public offering to make the apology? Guess which bow he used? The secretarial good morning. And the next day, the Keidenron, which is a Japanese round circle of business leaders, the CEOs of the 400 leading circles, censored him because he didn't apologize properly for the failure of a third tier supplier in the Toyota system. So what we see is that in Japan, this idea of culture is pervasive. And what we also see is profound knowledge is important. Where did that term come from? It was originated by Dr. Deming in 1992 in his book, The New Economics. And he never really defined profound knowledge uh, in the book. He gave four systems of thinking about what it was, and it wasn't very well defined. But he was 92 years old. Give the guy a break. You know, he, he gave a lecture like this, and they had to strap him into his chair because he had a propensity to fall out of this chair. I'm not there yet, although my assistant might disagree with me. Okay. But so profound knowledge, sorry, Selena, is statistical understanding of real world process behavior so a system's future states may be predicted with some probability. That's what science does. It predicts with probability. It's not a sure thing. There is always some probability. And there are four components. There's the structure of systems, and we're talking about process management. There's statistical thinking about process variation. That's statistical thinking. There's the development of knowledge, and that's the scientific method of inquiry. And the fourth is a psychological impact, which is about a collaborative culture and decision making. And so as we start looking at this, there is two different things. If we have in science a null hypothesis that we want to reject and we want to prove something, it's the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is profound knowledge. So what's the null hypothesis? Deming never said. And so I created one. I called it profane knowledge. And what I said is profane knowledge has these characteristics. 
It's linear. I think that tomorrow's going to be just like today. It's focused on the averages because we use averages to define everything. It's static in perspective. I don't see the dynamics of what's happening in the business. It ignores the people. It's enumerative use of data. That means I look at the whole collection, not at the linkages between them and causality. It's based on tribal lore. We've always done it this way, so we'll always do it that way. And it's also based on common sense, which the American humorist Will uh, Rogers says ain't so common. And it's also mindless reflection. We don't think about the depth of what's going on. And it's also victim of rapid decision making. On the other hand, profound knowledge is systemic, it's managing variation, it's dealing with the dynamics, it's understanding human nature, it's analytic or time series data where we can get causation, it's backed by science, it's based on uncommon logic, and it's mindful. And if we start taking a look, what we start seeing is this is what Duran was talking about big Q and little Q. So somebody was talking about strategy in their company this morning. They say, we are actually moving quality up to the strategic level. That's what Duran would call big Q. And that means at little Q level, we're managing the quality strategy. Uh, what certifications are we going to get? Uh, how do we actually put the, the Q mark on our products? You know, what do we actually do to train teams? That's little Q. Big Q is about the culture and the change of the organization for where we're going to go in the future. And we look at this, there's different levels. Guiding principles that Toyota had are at the top. And then we have organizing methods. How do we actually organize teams and structures to do things? Then we have activities and tools. And finally, at the bottom, we have the measures that we apply to understand those tools. And we start taking a look at those. We start seeing at the top, it's culture and organizations, but it's the mindset in the people. At the second level, this organizing, it's capability of systems, but it's the competence of the individuals. When we talk about activities and tools, it's the effectiveness of the outcome, but it's also the efficiency of the processes. And we get to the foundational measures, it's understanding performance to promise. Are we actually giving the customers what we said? But it's also about economy of resources. So we have to understand the human side of work. And when we take a look at this, you might have seen this, this diagram before. This is the Toyota house, uh, which they talk about in terms of the Toyota production system. And I changed something here. So it doesn't say respect for individuals. It says respect for humanity. Because this is another one of those mistranslated words, just like just in time was mistranslated. Just in time does not mean just in time at Toyota, by the way. They have buffer management systems. Nothing's done just in time. It's done just on time. There's a big difference. Just in time, you live from crisis to crisis. Just on time means you manage the flow. Does Toyota manage the flow or do they have crises? They manage the flow. Why don't they change the name? Well, again, that's another mistranslation. Because when they first started out, they started calling it just in time. They didn't have a Japanese word for it. So the Japanese word for just in time is JIT. And now we can't change JIT. And so the I is part of the Japanese language, so we can't change the language because that's what we said. So we're not going to change it, but we in Japan understand the meaning. If you guys in the West don't understand, that's your problem. You know, I asked Sorichito Toyota, I said, don't you care that these professors who come out and talk about what they've seen, they go to an American factory, they tell you all about lean systems at the Fremont uh, Numi plant, the New United Motors plant, uh, Toyota GM plant, and then they don't realize that you have dumbed down the system from Japan because the American trade unions won't take it. And so they talk about all of those lean things they see in these factories. Is A3 used in Japan? Not by Toyota. They use quality uh, control storyboards. QC stories is what they tell. A3 is in the US plant. It was written by two US professors from Georgia Tech and University of Michigan. And when I talked to them about this, I said, you owe this as an integrity part of academics. They said, well, if we ever write the second edition, maybe we'll make it a footnote. <laughs> but we follow it like it was the truth of what's actually driving Toyota, and it's not. Just like respect for individuals. So actually, I, I thought I'd give a little lesson in kanji here. So if we take a look at the term here in the kanji, so any type you see this type of term, it's coming from the 1600s. It means it's got old meanings. And this middle initial here, 
if it was respect for individuals, that wouldn't be there. Because what that does, it talks about collections of individuals, which turns it to society. And the reason that we have this respect for humanity is because we want to have in the workplace this term wa. And wa is meaning harmony, peace, or balance. And we have to have wa to have good flow. And so when we're looking at this, the role of leadership is to delegate decision rights and capacity to act to the people so that they'll be able to have the flow right and they can manage the flow. The executives don't manage the flow. So what does it mean to be human? Eliza Burrow Nishiburo created this in the 1930s. He's an interesting character in Japan because he's the guy who invited Albert Einstein to come to Japan in 1933. And I could talk about Einstein and his impact on the quality movement, which is also not known very much, because he actually had a major impact on everything that happened in quality, including Walter Schuhart's work. But what he said is that work consists of activity, some physical actions, creativity, producing something of value or innovative, and sociality, working together to give value for other people. And so when we look at this, what we start seeing is that when we're working, the idea is it's a purposeful expenditure of energy to achieve some sort of movement. So work is defined as moving. So I have a grandson who works by laptop and phone, then PlayStation, and then watching television. And I say, you're not moving, kiddo. You're not doing any work. Okay, so this is grandparents. And interestingly enough, this is a guy who's a biologist there, and in Yosho Kondo's, this was a book in 1989, written at the request of uh, uh, Kuro Ishikawa. Yosho Kondo was a, a psychologist in the quality movement, and he took those three definitions that came from Nishiburo, who was his professor at the University of Kyoto, and he said, we have creativity, and he matched this to the uh, breakdown or taxonomy of what it means to be human. And it's rather interesting because here's the sociality, that's the back brain, that's the animal brain. We work in packs. And then the creativity is the neocortex, that's the frontal brain. That's where we have innovation. This is the foundation of uh, brain physiology today. And the interesting thing was the only thing that overlapped was being happy and sad. Because animals, if you have a dog, they can be happy or sad, and people can be happy or sad. So it's kind of an interesting proposition. Now, when we look at work, we can have craft work or process work. Craft work means individual. It's not repetitive. It's going to be done by each individual person. Japan doesn't want craft work. They want to move the craft work to process work. So process becomes important. So this is Yoshio Kondo. He and I wrote a couple of books together back in uh, about 15 years ago. And he says that stimulating people to desire to work is motivation. That's the Japanese definition of motivation. You want to work. And then he said, people's sense of responsibility, oops, too many buttons, too many buttons. So people's sense of responsibility will increase in proportion to the freedom they're allowed and the, the choice of the means and methods by which they achieve this. And leadership is fostering this. Now he gave a model, and this is his model. So here we have leadership. So leadership is a driver. It's giving guidance and encouragement from the supervisor. Here is improvement and job design. In Toyota, that's what Shigeo Shingo contributed. It was training within industries, or how do we create job design? That was the Shingo contribution. Here is understanding humanity, and that's what Eliza Burrow, Nishiburo, and company delivered. And then we have self-control. Excuse me? Self-control, of course. Peter Drucker went to Japan in 1954. He was just in the process of writing The Practice of Management. In that book, he talked about what became called MBO, Management by Objectives. But in his book, he called it Management by Objectives and Self-Control. In the West, we dropped that self-control thing. You know, I don't want to be controlled by anybody. That's a bad word. So let's just have MBO. And then we totally perverted the meaning of it. 
But here, each person takes responsibility for their self-control, and as they control their self, they improve their ability. As they improve their ability, they gain their confidence and they're willing to participate. As they're willing to participate, they realize they are suffering from the input of other people. It's not that everybody's responsible for quality. I'm also responsible for input and delivering the right output. I'm part of the flow. And then finally, out of that, we get teamwork. And so as we start taking a look at this, this is daily management. Daily management occurs in teamwork when the people have been conditioned through that process. And so as we start looking at this, we see that there's one thing Deming, Drucker, and Duran all agreed on, and that's how do we actually get people to attain self-control. So it's knowledge of what they're supposed to do, knowledge of the job, uh, they can then have knowledge of, of uh, the process in which they're operating, the ability to regulate or self-regulate the process by going through all of these things. And so what that means is they can actually make choices about their work that are meaningful. How often do we actually delegate that choice that's meaningful to the worker? There's another little piece of, of mythology. Can the Toyota production worker stop the line? She said, come on, Greg, come on, don't tell me. They can't stop the line. No, they actually can't. They push a button, and the button will turn on an and-on light, and it'll also play a musical tone. Now, the reason the musical tone is there because music is happening at 360 degrees, and the supervisor can hear it. He only sees the and-on light line of sight. So that decreases the amount of time. Supervisor then goes to where the and-on light is on. And he has about a half a talk time to make one decision. The decision is, is it human error, in which case I have to train this person, I take them out of the line, I go up three levels to the training station and I train them, and then the water beetle comes in and takes over the job until the training is done. So the water beetle is the second in charge and he is there to audit the line and he has capability to do everything. So he's a supervisor in training. And then if it's not the human, then the supervisor stops the line because it's a system problem. You didn't read that, did you? That's not what they're talking about with lean. Workers can shut down the line. Well, actually, they really can't. The system shuts the line down because it's got logical checks and balances in that system. And if you go and start taking a look, when the, the, the lady who's giving you the tour at the Nagoya factory, she'll tell you all the stuff that's in the books, but if you actually understand what's happening on the line, she'll show you the Kanban system with the cards coming in but she doesn't talk about the electronic Kanban with a robot going by next door to that that's making sure that worker gets a cart of exactly the parts he needs for the car that's coming down. No Kanban card can do that. That's a computer. That's people like us as engineers who've actually figured out how do we coordinate the parts arrival to get that car built flawlessly at that particular point in time. So the way we do this is self-reflection. The word is Hanse. And Hansei is what I call standardizing worrying. So the person creating a problem must also accept personal responsibility for the shortcoming. And taking personal ownership for a mistake is a critical part of what Hansei is all about. In other words, it's natural in Japan to say, I screwed up. Taichi Ono said, everybody makes mistakes. Even a thief, the best thief breaking into a house doesn't get anything 50% of the time. If he's lucky, maybe 75% of the time he gets something. But he still makes mistakes and breaks into places that he shouldn't do. We will all make mistakes. And so mistake proofing is about keeping my mistake from affecting the next person in the process. So if the next person in the process is Pedro and I give him a mistake, we have now created an error. It's a different term. And if that error has gone from us outside into the general public, it's now called a defect. And so the Japanese are very precise about how they actually call these things and what it implies in the system. So what we see is that there's this word gemba. Now we throw around Japanese words all the time. And this Japanese word actually comes from a 1600 Chinese word, which is kanji, because there's a Japanese kanji, that's kanji character. And that has four components in the character. And so one of my good friends is, has been studying ancient Chinese characters that have come into Japan. And what this talks about, those four characters, it's the king at sunset surveying his kingdom and seeing a pigsty. Now, have you ever seen where pigs live? For those of you who are still in university and have roommates, 
Maybe your roommate. Okay. Those of you who laugh know exactly what I mean, don't you? Okay, so what was it? We can use the 5W1H. So what happened? It was a survey, a detailed scrutiny of what's happening. Who was there? The king. It's an executive function. So we think about the gamba for the workers, but actually the word comes from something for the king. When did it happen? At sunset, at the end of a reporting system. Where? At the place where the real work is being done. Why did it happen? To understand the real thing. And how did it happen? It was a personal activity to notice. Taichi Ono in Workplace Management, he talks about this and he says, you know, I learned about this from Hewlett Packard. They do what they call management by wandering around. It's a good thing. I'm going to call it a gamba walk because it's the king going to, this, to the workstation. And he says, and when you go there, don't look at the boards, look at the workers. Look at the workplace. You won't learn a thing by the boards. And what do I see in the gamba walks? Look at YouTube. Everybody's going around, oh, look at the board. Oh, that's really good, yeah. And then you ignore the workers, you ignore the safety things happening, you ignore the direct work. You don't understand where do workers need resources and where should we as an executive team be applying resources to improve the flow of the work. That's what it's supposed to do. So we're constantly seeking opportunities for improvement. It's part of the job of the executive function. And so what we see is in Japan, Gamble 1 is the operational function, the workers, plus the supervisor. Gamba 2 is this, so this is all tangible. Gamba 2 is an intangible workplace which involves the supervisor. They're pivoting back and forth between Gamba 1 and Gamba 2. And they are actually the translation function. And so what happens in a Japanese company is the supervisory role is much stronger than any we see in the West. And this is, I think, one of the secret ingredients. Because if you strengthen the supervisor role, they become sort of a manager and a worker, and they can help do the interpretation. And supervisors feel very proud. I was just teaching courses for ABB with their factory managers. And they say, yeah, that's exactly what we should be doing. And we need to redefine our role. And we start taking a look and we see the Gemba 1 measures are physical. They're actual entities. It's what's happening in the real world. It's the product or the service or the integration of you with a customer. Gemba 2 is a world of constructs. It's the financial world. It's all of the reporting, the overhead function, the allocation of assets and so forth. So Gemba 1 is based on scientifically sound observations. We're looking at what happened in the physical world. We can track it. Gemba 2 is based on an artificial construct. You know, an organization chart is an artificial construct. Is that something we should bow down to and use as the way for managing the whole organization? Actually, no. An organization chart is meant to communicate. It's meant to develop competence in an organization, not define the flow of work. And so as we're looking at these things, what we start seeing is there are major differences between Gamble 1 and Gamble 2. And uh, we can just go through and take a look at all of these. Now, this is something I haven't published yet, but I'm looking at drafting a book, or I've drafted the book already, about 100 pages. It's called A Tale of Two Gemba. And what happens is that most people who are in Gemba 2, I call them the process owners here, don't really think about what their job is because they're not being supervised the same way as you are in Gemba 1. They're not being held to the same level of accountability. They're doing the big stuff, okay? So they're taking a look at, at big E efficiency, which is defined by Chester Bernard as cooperation of the system. Little E efficiency is cycle time. It's waste elimination. It's availability of products. It's all the things that we talk about when we talk about OEE, or operational uh, efficiency, whatever it is. Anyhow, so if you've read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, system one thinking is here. That's this emotive thinking. 70% of all decisions are made based on emotions. And that's where they make the decisions in this executive suite. Gemba 2 is operating on system two thinking, logical thinking. We want to understand the process. We want to understand the workflow. We're going to do this by the scientific method. And so we have different types of learning, and what we find out is this function here is operating in an open loop. And it's not actually related at all to what's happening in the other Gemba. And so what we see is this role of the process owner. Some of you have seen this morning we were calling that a champion role or something. Like that. 
is an exceptionally important role because in, that's our one place where we can create that same pivot function as a supervisor in the Japanese system. So the tasks of the process owner are developing the system, managing the flow, and improving the capabilities. And specific responsibilities should be to assure that the process results occur, and we have good measurement systems, and the measurement system has integrity. One of my favorite people to read is Stephen Hawking. I always say his name, his job title wrong. I, I tend to call him a cosmetologist. And I always get, you know, sort of corrected. And it's cosmologist, not cosmetologist. Cosmetologist is doing the facial stuff. You know, cosmologist is studying the stars. But he said, the cost of bad data is the illusion of knowledge. And what happens? We give averages to the executives. We give what happened last month. They think they know what's happening. They have no idea what's happening. And because the bad knowledge goes up, they make bad decisions. Now, I talked to Peter Drucker about this. I had a beautiful opportunity to interview him for three days in 2001. I was president of ASQ. And one of my privileges was to invite the speaker. And I always wanted to have Drucker talk on quality. So I had Drucker come and talk on quality. And I said, you know, Peter, the question somebody asked here earlier this morning. You know, I'm in charge of quality. How do I get my executives to focus on quality? And he said something really interesting. That's not your job. Excuse me. I've got quality managers all over the world asking me exactly this question. He said, <clears throat> you know, the executives are actually smart people. Your job is to present data that has meaning and present it in such a clear way for the options of decisions that they can make that they will make the right decision on their own. You don't have to do quality for them. I've never met a CEO when I've asked them if they say they don't care about quality. I say, you don't care about profits? Yeah, I do. But we have to change their measurement system. They don't care about customers. If I say, if my CEO's going out to look at customers, our organization screwed up because he's got other better things to do. If he's spending his time with customers, who's actually running the ship and thinking about the future? So as we start taking a look at these things, we have to understand what is really the right responsibilities of the future. So in Japan, a mistake leads to an error, leads to a defect. I talked about that, I won't talk about that, but I do want to talk about JKK. JKK is something new. JKK was created by a man named Sasaki Sun, Sunichi Sakachi, who was the head of quality uh, at the board of directors of Toyota. He's now the president of the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, and he's in the International Academy for Quality with, with uh, Paolo and Pedro and myself. And he created this concept of ownership by the workers. It says the worker owns the concept of quality in their work, and it engages them in the responsibility to seek continual improvement of standard work. But Toyota is now moving the same JKK concept to the supervisor. And the supervisor is responsible for flow. And they're going to move it up to the executives and their responsibility for the allocation of resources. And so it's going to be a system of Conry. And as we start taking a look, each person does have a job and the jobs are different. And the quality that they pursue is different. As Taichi Ono says, in Japan it said time is the shadow of motion. In most cases, delay is represented by differences in operator motion and sequence. The job of the supervisor is to train the workers. Hmm. At the same time, workers must be taught to help each other. Carrying out standard work methods in the cycle time helps worker harmony grow. Well, that's a different way of interpreting things. And so when the Japanese describe waste, they actually use three words, muri, thou shalt not have irrational waste, mura, thou shalt not have flow waste, and muda, thou shalt not have waste in work discipline. I was giving a lecture in 2015 in, in to the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, to the counselors and, and executives there, and each of those wastes can occur at any level in an organization. However, my observation was, executive muri, waste associated with bad executive decisions, can create a systemic state of mura, bad flow in the organization, that creates a condition of muda in the workplace, and no matter how much you do 5S, the workers can't eliminate it. 
So if I, as an executive, blend my company with another as a joint venture or an acquisition, and I don't change the IT systems, I just created Mori. And that created a whole bunch of flow work for everybody underneath to go through and fix those. And the purple down below have a whole bunch of muda, and they can't do anything because I screwed up at the top. And I can point at countless organizations where that's exactly the truth. And so what we start seeing is there's different things happening at the three levels of the organization. The senior executive, their job is agility. I was uh, uh, coaching uh, Taizo Nishimura, the chairman of Toshiba, 2000, well, 1999 to 2001, 18 months. And he had in his office this kanji character that said agility. I said, that's a great word. And he says, yes, I, I have this to focus every day so I can reflect on what I have to do is my job to deliver agility. I said, well, what's a good word for me? He says, let me think. And, and 18 months later, he gave me my word. So they work on policy, and their waste is mori. They have to eliminate irrational waste in the company. And that's done in consonance with the guiding principles. The middle part of the organization is cross-functional management. They're worrying about harmony, wa, flow. And they work on mura, no wasteful flow. And that's talking about the methods that are applied. At the front line, it's discipline, cho choosing perfection, going to get no waste in the system, and that's what Muda is. And that's about the activities and tools. So when I had, the, the, at his retirement ceremony, Nishimori san gave me my kanji character. And my kanji character is work hard. It can also be translated as discipline. And that's because he says, you are the one who's teaching us how we work here. I am creating the flexibility, the agility of the organization. And so what we see in Japan is they have different teams that run these things. They're called Jesuikan teams. Jesuikan teams means a second set of eyes. I'm coming to look at this organization. When the executive goes on the gamble walk, the second set of eyes is there. But they're not to look at it as a worker. They're to look at it as an executive. And the question they should be asking is, have we actually reached the maximum capability of this process that my people can do, and do they need additional resources to go further? Is this where we should be allocating resources to make the flow go better? And so that's all about the second set of eyes working. So they call Jesuikan teams, any executive team, any project team, any work team, they're all called Jesuikan teams. It's the second set of eyes. It's how we collaborate together in the workplace to see what's going on. I don't say, Pedro, you've got to say everything that's wrong there. No, we all have to see it together. And to do this, we have to have a cursed personal commitment to what's called Jisoo Conry. And Jisoo Conry is something I've never seen any of these American consultants talk about because it's the self-mastery system of each individual. When we apply Hansei to our work, we realize that we have something to improve. And so that's the job of each individual person. And so we take the second half of this matrix, and what we start seeing is each of these people in this process has a different thing going on. So Hoshin Conry, that's managed by the executive team. It's about trying to find the strategy. It's supported by things like a presidential review, the S7 strategic tools. It's supported by the cross-functional teams. Those are Jesuikan teams. And in, in their uh, process, they have someone who acts like a master black belt in Six Sigma. At this second level here, those cross-functional teams, they're doing Kaizen Conry. Now, Kaizen Conry is different than just Kaizen. It's actually a system of projects created at this level of the organization because the Hoshin projects do not affect them. So these managers can still do improvement projects as long as it doesn't countermand or conflict with the Hoshin Conry project. So these are gonna flow down. And they have gamble walks, they have 5S for managers, which is not the same as 5S for workers. That's another problem we can get into. There's actually a 10S system in the Toyota management system, not 3S or 5S. And they have project teams and they have like black belt support. And then we come down to the workplace, Nichijo Conry. Nichijo Conry is daily management. Conry just means management system, by the way. And here they have both Hinshitsu Conry at both levels. That's quality control. Hinshitsu comes from the, the uh, old Chinese word of an archer who's able to shoot an arrow on target. So that's what the word quality actually means, to get an organization on target and to keep shooting on target. 
And so here we see it's the check function for daily management, and it's also the check function for cross-functional management. So as we start taking a look, we start seeing that this human aspect of work contributes a lot to what's going on. So every uh, person contributes a part of the puzzle. Collectively, the puzzle comes together and starts making sense. And we actually can start building something of it, and then to achieving that shared result is happening through mutual collaboration towards the common goal. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and uh, we'll come back and I'm going to then finish the last, I think it's 30 slides, which are now going to get into the detail of the Hoshan Khanri system. Now you've got the background, and we'll actually then talk about how they put it together and the structure of it. Okay?